Allora, eh, no. Well, ok, I will speak in Italian and I thank you as an Italian for so doing. I am glad for this invitation. I would like to make congratulations for this uh, timely initiative. And uh, honestly speaking, I wish to express my two, the two great issues and the problems vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Paris uh, summit uh, that will take place in December this year in order to try to focus on specific uh, issues concerning uh, uh, climate change negotiations. The main problems are the following. First, a difficulty in uh, meeting, in uh, having uh, and meeting an effective and high-level agreement. Secondly, uh, relationship and uh, uh, posture vis-a-vis -vis public opinion. For sure, an agreement will be uh, met in Paris. Uh, French diplomacy is uh, strongly committed in this. And uh, President Hollande, Minister Fabius, uh, who are following negotiations, uh, um, are truly convinced of this. And very often, Mr. Fabius repeatedly says, uh, there is no plan B, because we don't have a planet B. However, we should be aware of a fact, in my view, that is Paris conference is at risk of a failure, not less than uh, it was for, for the uh, conference, the Copenhagen uh, conference, uh, which was uh, a uh, clear failure. Why is there, why do we have this risk? Because uh, Europe is uh, the mostly politically motivated actor to find an agreement for the post-Kyoto. However, at the same time, Europe is uh, less and less important uh, under the political viewpoint, unfortunately, and is counting less for emissions. Today already, uh, Europe accounts less than 10% of global emissions which should be uh, a, a little above 6% in 2030. Therefore, the emitting countries are not the countries which organize, which invest so much faith and trust in the uh, summit today in Paris, yesterday in Copenhagen. This agreement must be an important and far-reaching agreement. It is difficult and uh, we all understood that it is uh, difficult to find an agreement among and between the single countries which have uh, radically, deeply different uh, requirements under the social economic viewpoints and environmental viewpoints. This is very worrying that if we consider the 28 European countries which collectively signed, we have uh, not, uh, we have not uh, arrived yet at 40 countries who uh, submitted their pledge, their commitment concerning the translation of the uh, Lima conference results, which stated each country uh, within March 31 must submit its uh, pledge inside of the conference. Unfortunately, a minimal number of member countries did that. And this is not positive for the uh, development in Paris. We risk to prolong and to lengthen timing for the um, Paris negotiation to meet one agreement, if not necessarily the agreement that should be needed. Here, at the Chamber of Deputies in Rome, we promoted the uh, public hearing and at the presence uh, of the ministries of the Italian government and the representative of the French government, and together with uh, the FAO general director and the representative of the Holy See, because you might know that the Pope is uh, preparing an encyclica on uh, um, the uh, climate change uh, and environmental issues. And we made some proposals uh, that we defined as asymmetric proposals. That is, uh, 
since on the one hand it is necessary to have a global post-Kyoto agreement, it should be useful that international community focused and could focus on some objectives, even partially objectives which could be met. And we made the three proposals, uh, quite multifaceted proposals. And one concert the fact that uh, the possible uh, agreement uh, is accountable in the Paris, uh, that is, it can be verified and can be transparent. And in conclusion, I will come back to transparency issue. So a number of measures, for example, uh, the 2015 conference provides the implementation of the agreement by 2020, and is five years, that's too long. And the idea that at least a part of the agreement can be implemented between 2015 and 2020 because the time issue is a crucial issue. And also we made a proposal, a sensible proposal, which was reconsidered also by the EU Commission and by the European Council for Environment. And we could use the technical issue that is there is the most important success story of uh, the uh, global environmental uh, negotiations, which is, which is uh, the Montreal Protocol, uh, which uh, uh, could uh, eliminate or ban CFCs and other chemical compounds, uh, which uh, uh, impoverish the ozone layer and increase the uh, incidence of uh, the uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, rays with uh, um, in consequences uh, at global level. And that this protocol uh, could be used uh, without the need of a new treaty, uh, it could be used uh, to phase out uh, some substances which were not included as HFCs, which have an enormous impact on the greenhouse effect. So for example, if we ban HFCs in the uh, time of life of this uh, substance, this would have an effectiveness equal to 18% of the greenhouse effect of CO2. And this is huge. It's not uh, peanuts. This is feasible. This is fast and very easy and significant. And the uh, third element we focus on is agriculture and forestry. And we should consider that we as Italian, we have here uh, IFAD, FAO um, headquarters. And this year, we have the expo going on in Milan, which raised the issue of the um, food waste um, reduction. And uh, a lot of emission could be reduced only by reducing uh, food waste. This is of a great value, ethical value, social value, and environmental value. So these are the three proposals uh, we made in parallel to the idea of a global uh, agreement, which is at the background. And the second the crit criticality is the following. Expectations for the um, next conferences where that there would be a uh, fundamental agreement uh, and uh, against the growth of uh, uh, the scientific community awareness, which is granted now. You know, some years ago, there could be some debate going on on the fact that the greenhouse effect or the um, effect on the climate of CO2 emissions would really be so serious that it would bring a significant climate change. Today, this is no longer so. The international community found an agreement, a very far-reaching, almost uh, unanimous agreement. However, that mobilization of a public opinion, which existed until a few years ago, and it was a significant mobilization, is no longer here. Why this? In my opinion, because the technicality of these agreements uh, is such that uh, ordinary people uh, 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 can't understand the two complex uh, agreements uh, with uh, too many norms and rules, and each country can decide for a different platform. A country can decide for a date 
not uh, at court. That is, uh, as from when uh, limitation must be set. Another is focused on energy efficiency. Another country is focused on the reduction of energy intensity. Another country is focused on a timeline which is, which goes very far in the future. So there is no one single understandable framework so that people, public opinion can mobilitate and ask to their government to take credible commitment. So the paradox of the climate is this one. That is, today we are, we all agree on the scientific viability of results of the UN Committee on Climate Change. Uh, we, which uni unites uh, and uh, pulls together uh, most of scientists. However, public opinion is no longer really interested in all these issues. Why this? Because there is a lack of confidence and trust vis-a-vis -vis these um, summits with thousands of people traveling all over the world. Because for each summit, the most uh, clicked uh, information is uh, which emissions, how, ma how many emissions were there in order to have people travel back and forth to the summit. And another element is the economic crisis. The emerging countries say to the developed countries, which say you polluted. And uh, uh, some countries uh, would be like to compute emissions from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution because the OECD countries had the emissions they, they wanted and uh, the emerging countries uh, call for their right to have emissions. So how can we uh, put together the representatives of the small Pacific Islands who fear being flooded by the rise of the sea level and large Asian countries which could, could pollute? as the OECD countries did in the last decades. So how can we put together in all this the uh, South uh, American or African countries which go fast from 1 billion to 2 billion inhabitants with all the related issues? So how can we mobilitate the public opinion? In my view, the fundamental point for this meeting is how to restore trust among public opinion. That is, we have a national government in Italy and the European Union, and we should ask the governments to stick and comply to verifiable and transparent principles, because if there is no transparency, why people should ask reduce pollution and uh, uh, greenhouse effect. And one last thing. Today, very much probably, the best news is uh, the uh, agreement between Obama and the uh, Chinese president. And the best allied is the uh, worst uh, polluter, China. Because paradoxically, in China, public opinion is beginning to be heard, to raise his voice. And uh, since incidents on global pollution is huge, and is, uh, has an impact on the daily life of people. And in China, there are millions of uh, people who are used uh, to get their fish on a river, who are used uh, to get their vegetables in a small orchard. And today, this salad is uh, uh, polluted. These people were used uh, to drink safe water, or they were used uh, to breath, very much simply. Well, this factor of the local crisis of uh, the largest factory of the world can become a thrust to give a global response. So I just mentioned some uh, paradox and some criticalities. I do not think it is easy to outline an uh, easy result for uh, Paris conference. However, I do hope that this kind of a conference can push towards a credible and transparent agreement to restore the conditions for a public opinion a commitment, which is no longer confident and is looking at these summits as something very far away. away. Thank you.